Hi, everyone, and welcome. It is February 9th. It is Wednesday, and it's time for the Topher Spin Knowledge Bolite Hangout. We are back from Tucson. I'm there for 16 days, had a splendid time, met a lot of people, and spent a lot of time with a lot of good friends. Spent a lot of time in the cold, cutting meteorites, and, uh, and talking and chatting. We had a fire. It was great. Tonight, we're, we're going to be discussing irons. We have a bunch of irons to discuss. We're only um, talking about three main classifications of them, though. So stay tuned for Meteorite 101 for a deep dive into the science behind iron meteorites. If you look back over YouTube, you'll see a video that I just put up of us cutting meteorites at the Meteorite Mansion. Had a blast doing it. It's just one of the many videos that we recorded and I will be posting. They're pretty interesting or they're pretty boring, depending on uh, how you think cutting meteorites outside goes. But um, there's a new video that I put up from one of our Knowledge Bolide friends, Sean Mahoney from the Outer Spacer Meteorites. Just a really, really cool guy. Uh, uh, he has an Australian accent and he's in Spain hunting a meteorite that fell three days earlier, three or four days earlier. Um, he comes across this really, really beautifully desolate, sad place. It's an abandoned village and generations of people have lived there up until recently. So if you want to find out why they don't live there anymore, go there and watch the video on my YouTube channel. It's, it's really a really a cool video and he does a great job narrating around as he does it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. You should enjoy it. Like I said, we just got back from Tucson and I, I have to tell you guys, uh, just from a, a market report of pricing, if you have Mars and Lunar, hold on to it. <laughs> there is not a whole lot of uh, lunar and Martian material uh, available. Um, haven't seen a whole lot come out lately in Tucson. There really wasn't a lot of it around. And if you did see uh, lunar, the pricing went up probably about 40% over the last six or eight months, I'd imagine. So that, that's something to know. If you have Chelya Banks and if you have Lunar and Mars, you, your, your investments are paying off. <laughs> um, a new really cool meteorite that's been approved, but not published, not published on the Met Bowl, but it's been approved by the scientists is waiting at the nomenclature committee now is Tiglet. Tiglet is a funny name, but a serious meteorite. It's a witness meteorite that we first thought was a lunar when they were picking it up. It turns out that it's an Albright. So that is the hottest new meteorite that was in Tucson. The other thing that I can report is that, and maybe Pat, you can ring in on this because you're the NWA junkie. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was your shopping in Tucson this year? Well, my shopping in Tucson... Um was uh, mixed, I think, to say the best, uh, in, in terms of uh, unclassified NWAs. I, I more than made up for it in other things. The number of Moroccan dealers was greatly reduced. And in talking with some uh, friends that, that spent part of the year uh, living in Morocco, uh, right now, you can get out. That's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> but flying back home is currently not very possible unless you have connections, I think. So, and I'm not talking about airplane tickets. Um, so in general, there weren't that many uh, NWAs for sale. So I had to resort to bribery of my fellow uh, Meteorite Mansion occupants. And I did score a couple of quite nice rocks, um, but... Um, a lot fewer to look through, and our favorite uh, dealer, Muhammad Ismali, uh, was not there, um, which changed the dynamics of uh, of the whole NWA buying situation there. I agree. And how many hours do you think we spent in his room throughout our 16-day stretch last time? Um, <laughs> roughly 20%, yeah. maybe 25%. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, when I was in Tucson this time, I said I got to meet a lot of people. We had uh, Jules fly in. We also, I also got to read my, uh, meet Ron Metzkes. Hard, hard time saying that. So, um, Ron, you were you were in Tucson. What's uh, what's your little recap or opinion? Okay, um, I I was able to find some NWAs, but oddly enough, I found most of them away from the days in. Uh, uh, but I, I did notice that prices this year are up significantly, especially for irons. Uh, I'm an iron co collector, and I 
we only have found like at Ford were some small highly oriented cotyledons, you know, 10 grams, 15, 20 grams. I did, I did get a, a large NWA uh, sphere over at the, at the Ramada, uh, but I, I was just shocked at how much prices went up this year. Um, you know, being on a fixed budget, you know, I usually find six or eight irons. This this time I came back with mostly mostly uh, chondrite slices. Yeah, I th there were a few iron slices that I bought. I, I actually bought a lot of iron slices, but they're all about this big. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I I can find small of them. I'm I, I like big things. And yeah. uh, one nice piece I did find was an outstanding piece of living desert glass from Blaine Reed. Um, that uh, I, I put a flashlight behind it just it just lit up the room basically. This is the Libyan Desert Glass I bought last week in Tucson from Blaine Reed. It's a very nice piece, but it holds kind of a secret. It's got that little cool little thing right there. It looks like a leaf, but it's really just an occlusion with sand in it. One of the reasons I bought it, but it also has this. It's pure green. Look at that. Put a good flashlight behind it, and it is just bright bright apple green all the way around i was a little disappointed with the iron situation everything's going up everything yeah, what about sakati aline sakati aline no, yeah, a lot. you get um three to five dollars a gram uh, the better stuff is ten dollars a gram really you know, oriented holes and sculpted and you know, yeah Wow. Yeah, uh, they used to have big bins that you could just go through, yeah. and it'd be yeah. like two kilos in there, and you yeah. go through through an eye loop, and it was a buck a gram. The yeah. cheapest I saw was like three dollars a gram for those type of quality. And um, yeah, you're right, Ron. Ten dollars a gram on, on a lot of stuff. I was surprised. So is the is the prices going up because there were fewer dealers there that could raise their prices? Or no, I, I don't think it's that. I think it's really no. market driven right now. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it really is the market. I, know why. I got to talk to uh, D May and Serga from the, the real comic shop, and um, they have remarked that there is just really very, very little more coming out. And what stuff is coming out is stuff that was in a very low, swampy area that's uh, quite corroded. So it's you know, it's supply and demand, and there's not much new supply, and there's still plenty of demand. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard that uh, Chelyu Banks hunting the last two seasons were not very profitable, um, and you can see that in the Chelyu Banks prices. Yeah, a very, very reputable dealer had a bin of Chelyu Banks. They were nice, but they were marked between $30 and $60 a gram. Yeah. No wow. way. Wow. Well, when, when Chelyu Banks first came out, it was $30 a gram. Yeah, it dropped. Now it's going back up for some reason. If you're looking for ones that have been protected, the, the fusion crust is all bubbly and jet black and not knocked into other rocks. They've been separated and kept separate from each other rather than just bundled together. Those carry a premium, you know. And one of the uh, meteorites that I saw in, in a number of dealers uh, was the old Gadamas, which is now H A H three forty six. Three forty six. Uh, there were a number of dealers that had them, and oh man, were they pretty! Just totally beautifully pristine, preserved carefully, scrape marks. There was a 2.6 kilogram one that didn't come home with me, but there was a 690 gram that did. Um, Ooh. Ooh, yeah, Gadamas is a really beautiful one because it has these character, very characteristic scuff marks of where they impacted into the sand. So, and there was a lot of them there. They were all beautiful. And there is something else that is beautiful. And that is my wife. And I'm going to introduce a new segment on the Knowledge Bolide. And this is something that I never thought I would say about Sue. She reads the Met Bowl. And she like loves gathering information and facts from the Met Bowl. And the Met Bowl, for those on YouTube that may not know, is the online database of official meteorites that have been scientifically classified and then published. It's available to anyone free of charge. And um, that's the Bible of meteorite. So Sue is going to go through a the month of January in review. Just gonna review the uh, meteorites that were approved and published in January of 2022. Um, so we had uh, 59 meteorites altogether. 
uh, we had uh, nine named and uh, 50 NWAs. And of all those 59, there was one fall. So they, we had two in South America, one in the Caribbean, one in China, and that was the fall actually. And the uh, rest of them were all in uh, Northwestern Africa and um, Algeria, uh, one in Egypt, but um, heavy concentration in Morocco, actually. I think there were 14 or 15 of them from Morocco this month. And the two in South America are actually the only ones that were uh, not new this time. They've just been revised and added to. One was um, changed from just a, a, a named find and a B. They've added a C to it now. So uh, nothing super new there. The meteorites, um, we had classifications. We had a uh, chondrite ungrouped, diagenite, a mesociterite, a Martian, an enstatite, two eucrites, two albrights, three irons, four lunar, five carbonaceous, 11 H class, and 27 L class. The fall was in China. Really wasn't a lot of information about this fall. It was kind of surprising. Most of the information is actually on the map bulb, but I believe it's Kuiwanhu, uh, and that was a eucrite, and uh, it actually fell and uh, near a like a power plant. It was a it's a probable fall. It fell in January of last year. Nobody found it. A bunch of meteorite hunters went out looking for it. They didn't see anything. And then uh, later in May, two workers uh, happened to cross two, um, two of the stones and they were shiny, fresh black fusion crust on them. So of course, a bunch of meteorite hunters came back looking and they found five more. So there were seven uh, rocks altogether with a total known weight of about 900 uh, grams, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so that was finally just uh, finalized and classified last month. So that was the only um, fall. And then the uh, ones that were interesting were, um, I'm not sure, I've never heard of this one before, but um, it's called Malotas. And uh, that one is a uh, find from 1931 down in Argentina in Buenos Aires. It was uh, classified finally, um, this version of it, just last month. Topher, you might have to help me out here, but we talked about this a little bit and uh, just how important it is to keep lots of notes and also so important to donate pieces of your meteorite to science because sometimes 80 years later, uh, you know, 100 years later, they are, they'll find new things. So this one uh, was in a museum. Uh, I think that's related to Cordoba University, mm -hmm. and it was not until 2015 that a scientist was there looking at them and said, these are two different classifications, but they're being presented as the same meteorite. And sure enough, she was right. So uh, a bunch of pieces were set all over the uh, planet to India, to um, I, I think Australia, I'm trying to remember all the different places, um, to be studied by all different types of, uh, all different fields of science. So uh, if, if, I remember didn't, if I remember yeah, correctly, <laughs> they were actually displaying the two stones side by side. One was a Ukrite and one was an L5. That's yeah, so yeah, the new one is an L5. That's the one that uh, got reclassified as, as the C. Took someone that long, someone finally noticed it. I don't know, I feel like if the uh, Knowledge Bowl like crew had gone through that museum, you guys would have discovered it a lot sooner. Um, <laughs> it was a pretty smart oh, yeah, here. <laughs> quite a delay <laughs> yeah really uh, and then the other one that was there's a lot of um, discrepancies and uh, different information uh, conflicting uh, opinions and facts being given is uh, Cuba there's only two meteorites that have ever been na uh, named in Cuba and uh, one of them we all know is Vignales and the other one is actually called Cuba and that one was found in 1871, and it's literally still getting revised today. So that's, like I said, that's how important it is to, um, for people to donate the, the slices, the thin sections, and uh, make sure that scientists have that uh, to study, because whatever tools they're using now, they might be using something uh, more technologically advanced 100 years from now. So who knows what they'll find. Topher, do you remember a little bit more about that one? Yeah, this is the one that they thought might uh, be a piece of Toluca because mm -hmm. they were doing some research on it and it's a it's the same almost same classification as Toluca and they thought somehow maybe a piece got from Mexico to Cuba. But when they're doing more research, um, Bushwald, who's very famous for iron research, and a lot of other scientists have now uh, have all weighed in. But the thing that's funny about it is Remember it said, it's still not decided. 
They, yep. they have not decided <laughs> if it's the same meteorite or not yet. So, yes. Yeah, I, I think that so was that's what they've I, added. Yeah, that's what yeah. they've added in January. They basically came out and said, hypothesis has never been corroborated, um, but it's never been completely ruled out. So like I said, it's not a new meteorite, but new information has come forward for those. So those were the two from uh, South America. So really, it's like everything's still happening over in Africa, <laughs> for the most part, mm -hmm. for new stuff. But yeah, um, so hopefully you guys found that information uh, interesting. There were a lot more stories and things like that, but you know, we only have an hour, right? <laughs> yeah, awesome. That was really Thank cool. <laughs> yeah, well, good. We're gonna we're gonna keep it up because here at the Knowledge Bolide, we're all about having fun and learning stuff. So <laughs> we appreciate that that uh, checking on the Met Bull, and now we're gonna go to a little bit of uh, show and tell, and we're still gonna have a little bit of fun with it. So first, I want to introduce my new friend Ben. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a Knowledge Bolide member. Our Ben Fischler, Fischler, sorry, with his Sakota Lynn on his mustache. <laughs> a, a great picture, man. And today's the Sakota Lynn's birthday, I think, just about. That's the 12th, isn't it? Usually. The 12th? Okay, so three I days. Think so, from yeah. Now. Yeah. This is one that I ran into in Tucson that I could not even dream of affording, but wanted to share with you guys. So Ooh. this is Miles. This is 168 grams of Miles, a silicated iron. This is the polished side and you can even see the crystal grains in the metal on this side. But the edge side is absolutely fantastic. How crazy beautiful is that? I totally want to own this piece. Uh, first thing I asked him, did you buy it? <laughs> like, no, that's, I think that's like a $5,000 piece. Yes. It's, it's a, yeah, it's, did you see it, Ron? You were there, Ron? Uh, I've seen some just like that, and it's one of my dream pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. It's super special. Yes. Um, here's another one that we can't afford. <laughs> All right, we are in K&D Meteorites, and check this out. This is a Mount Dueling 27 kilogram showstopper. I oh, yeah. Oh. This is 100% not a cutter. Absolute display ready. Sharp sharp lines on it beautiful regmaglyphs all over this puppy multiple regmaglyphs lined up right here beautifully detailed fine edges that show no wear whatsoever and then on the very front you have these two nodules that are now gone revealing a beautiful beautiful face to that meteorite that's a stunning piece, huh? Wow, I saw that one. Matt, <laughs> would you be able to carry that one down to your basement? Um, uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> only, only 27 <laughs> kilos. Yeah, he'll, yeah. Find, he'll find a way. <laughs> oh, I, I do have to say that uh, honorary professor Pat holds the record for this Tucson <laughs> trip's heaviest meteorite. Yeah, I, I, I think I did. Uh, I was offered a uh, 59 kilo St. Albans that I couldn't say no to. And uh, I haven't been able to con any of my neighbors yet to help me unload it out of the back of the van. So it's still sitting out. <laughs> <in the back laughs> <of the van. laughs> 59 kilos. Yeah. I don't want to displace the king. This is one of my uh, ones that I actually sold. This is a Gebel Chamel. It's an iron ungrouped. I don't think there's there's no audio on this one, but it's from Egypt, and it's famous for as we always say that uh, tangerine or orange skin, lizard, lizard skin, lizard oh, skin. Yeah, yeah just a, a beautiful meteorite that that shows shrapnel and all kinds of cool stuff in it. Oh, we were talking about um, iron meteorite prices. Um, iron oh, meteorite oh. prices. Oh. This one, Twanberg does not change it is 25 dollars a gram it has been 25 dollars a gram and it will be 25 dollars a gram it is it is the most stable meteorite i know is that yours 
but this is not 664 grams. This must be 6.64 grams. Sorry about that. But this is uh, Chris Monks. He That's got great. it. And, yeah, 6.64 oh. grams. Okay. It's, it's really dense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> black, black hole material there. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a nice slice, too. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. And is that in his sales inventory or a private collection? Private collection. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ooh, Ron, you're up, buddy. Check this thing out. Yeah, that's okay. one I've had for a number of years. I, I did buy this one in Tucson. Um, but yeah, it's one of my favorite meteorites. It's uh, very stable. Uh, if you zoom in, it, it, it has, a, it has a, an altered uh, crystal structure. If you zoom, you know, if you had a, I've got a high resolution um, scan of it. And if you zoom in, you see a very, very fine Woodman-Staten lines. Wow. I mean, just the finest you can imagine. But this is an altered piece. And can you describe what altered means? Don't mean to put you on the spot, buddy. I'm sorry. Well, well let me let, <laughs> no, me, ask, we let me ask you a question while he's looking that up. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see 1810 Columbia. Uh, uh, Colombia, I didn't think you could um, export uh, meteorites out of that country. Boyaca, Colombia. I don't know how it got out here, but I'm glad it did. No, <laughs> really? <laughs> probably the, 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 yeah. At that I, time, it probably was okay. Yeah, I bought uh, this in, huh. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I bought this in 2016, five years ago, six years ago. The uh, altered octahedrite, if you go on the net, though, it'll probably tell you more about it than I can real quick pull out of my head. Um, but I believe... It was used, was this the one that was used as an anvil? Not, I don't remember. It may have been. Oh, uh, yeah. Because it would it would change and, and compact yeah. the pattern. Yes, yes. It, it also wow. seems to show a recrystallization uh, band around the edge of it as well. It could be, yeah. It's got something like a heat, I don't know if it's a heating rim or what. This is one of, one of my better slices. Nice. Yeah, it's it's pretty, man. Yeah. Definitely a unique pattern on it. Yeah, Gariat, this is a 55 gram one. Uh, this one I, I obtained just uh, three years ago in, in Tucson. Uh, this came out, uh, it's a medium octahedrite, it's 2D classification. And this came out of Mike Miller's uh, inventory. There's a kind of a long story here. I, a few, about a year before I bought this, I bought a Bondock slice from, from Mike. And unfortunately, it sat on my shelf for about six months and just turned to dust. So I, I called Mike, I, and I, he, you know, he said, okay, send it back. I'll give you credit. Six months later, Tucson, I went down there. I said, hi, Mike, remember me? He says, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, remind, had to remind him. He said, oh, yeah. In fact, every one of his slices did the same thing. So oh no! Give me a credit on it, which was about six hundred and fifty bucks or something. It was an expensive piece, um, and I I saw the Garriott sitting in the corner there in his in his cabinet, and it was way more than that. So I <laughs> ended up spending a lot more money and obtained this piece from him. Yeah, so it was it was it was a it was a long long acquisition. It took me six months uh, from the time I returned to the bond dock to this and got so. So it's sitting, it's very stable. It's, it's, it's a beautiful piece. It's about uh, three inches long by about two inches tall. It's wow. about as long as dimensions. This picture right here is quite striking. When, when I open it up and put it into PowerPoint, I'm like, man, Ron, you made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I may actually use that for the thumbnail of, the, of today's video. I think it's cool. that striking right. of, a video, uh, of a picture, man. Okay. So thank right. you. We, we mentioned Toluca earlier. This is a Toluca sample that I sold, unfortunately. This is the Toluca, the, the one that they thought might be uh, Cuba. The Cuba might be this one. But, Does anybody want to guess who bought it? Oh, oh. Oh. That was on your birthday, wasn't it, this last it year? Was, this was my Christmas present. Oh, Christmas. <laughs> oh. That's awesome. I love the, the hash marks. It almost looks like someone took sandpaper to it. Yeah. Look at that. Are you uh, guys nice. ever going to ask for anything besides meteorites now for gifts? Like no. Christmas, birthday? It's pretty much meteorites only, is, huh? What else is, is there? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what else is there? 
<laughs> we're working out like a gift card bartering system. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm well, actually waiting. I'm actually waiting for Topher's site to go up because my girlfriend doesn't know how to buy meteorites. They're like, don't buy anything <laughs> expensive from eBay until you talk to me. Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys kind of brought that up because <clears throat> I, I hate putting little commercial plugs in, but it's so it's cool. it's really the topic of conversation is is where do people buy meteorites? Obviously, Tucson's a great place eBay used to be a good place. Uh, now it's just a cesspool. And I don't mean to offend any of my friends who are selling on eBay, but they're, you're the minority. There is yeah. so much garbage out there. We're still selling there too. So. Yeah, <laughs> oh, we're still For selling. Now. Yeah. For yeah, now. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the problem with eBay is that if you don't know about media rights, you don't know what the hell you're buying. It looks good on the photos in eBay, but if you don't know the mm -hmm. dealer, you're really in trouble. Uh, there's so much junk out there. It's I, and I, I never I realized it was that bad. I mean, it's, it's, I'd say half of them out there. They're crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And they're making interesting fakes. It's like, you look at it and you're like, mm -hmm. it looks kind of okay, but there's something wrong with it until you look closer. Yeah. The ones I like are the Sarah's, the big Sarah shows. Yeah. So those are, yeah. Oh my or, God. or the ones that are like broken down. They're, so they're still made of meteorite material, but they're like remanufactured from all the shrapnel on the ground. And they still like, show me one of those pellicites and they just don't look yeah. good. Well, the, yeah. The things that get me are the ones that they've taken a, a slice and they've cut you know, like circles and squares out of them and you see a bunch of, <laughs> bunch of holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The well, and, and there's other the other people are out there that are just selling earth rocks and yeah. whether they know or don't know they're yeah. still doing it and they're still scamming people i've reached out to a boatload of them and most just don't care like they they'll tell me that their rent's due next month like we don't have responsibilities in our lives and they need to scam other people so a lot of dealers are kind of like what do we do how do we get our 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 products to market well they're starting their own web pages and each dealer has to have their own web page after it's a lot it's so much there's so much behind it so i kind of built the safe sellers list uh, of sellers that i and the group trust and know of they're known entities and we trust them so i've decided to, to start a, a, a an e-commerce platform if you will solely for meteorites and meteorite related stuff and whether books we're going to move into impact material i hope it's basically a safe place it's the meteorite vault.com it's not ready yet we are working on it around the clock myself sue is my partner and we also have a partner in uh, adam in philadelphia and a development team working on the web page there's a lot that goes into this to make it right and i'm not going to roll out anything that's that uh it's not 100% functional and, and up to par. So please bear with me, but the meteoritevault.com is coming soon. Everything is safe there and there'll be extra features that you can't get on, on an eBay or things like that. But it, there's gonna be a lot of functionality, a lot of searching you can do that's geared. The, the sales of the, the search engine is geared towards meteorites. You're gonna be able to find stuff you want a lot easier and have a much more pleasant experience. So that that's coming soon. And that was really an impromptu little ad there. So I appreciate you guys. And just to, just to reiterate, you know, every single thing that you buy there is going to be authentic because Topher is vetting everybody. There's no filling in a ticket, submitting a ticket and, and hoping that, that, you know, this company will take the, these fraudulent sellers down. There won't be any there to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need, I need to never go to eBay again because it's not good for my mental health. <laughs> <laughs> We work all day at making sure the most authentic, real, and professional meteorite <clears throat> experience is delivered. And I go out on eBay, and I'm just like, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. So, okay. But one thing that can help you protect yourself from getting scammed is to educate yourself. And that's why each week we offer Meteorite 101, a deep dive into the science behind meteorites. This week, I really wish I wrote down the, the numbers. Um, I have it right here, guys. All right, so today we're doing irons part one, and Mike Kelly, our geologist, is going to dig into the, the chemistry, the history, some stories uh, about irons. We divided them into three different weeks because they're really a lot to digest and a lot of different samples to show. Two, two. Two weeks. Oh, good. Yeah. We did better than I thought. Three, so, three for carbon, carbonations. Three for carbonations. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we did better, better, better than I thought. Today we're going to be discussing the classifications of 
um, I, C, you can say I or one. So one C, two A, B, two C, two D, and two E. Those are the, the irons that we're gonna be delving into. And Mike, I turn it over to you. Sure, yeah. So uh, Topher already mentioned the, the types we're talking about here. So there's, there's it is just on the screen. So yeah, there are a lot of different uh, iron types. Uh, there's uh, 13 total groupings. Uh, plus the ungroups, so we're covering only uh, five of them tonight. Um, so a little bit of the background, uh, you know, we, we call them iron meteorites, but really they're, you know, blends of iron and nickel uh, to make the meteoritic metal. And the other term you'll probably hear is uh, siderites. Um, so that was uh, coined by Professor uh, Mescaline back in 1863. So the irons have been part of our classification system for a very long time. And siderite just uh, describes... Uh, a composition that has uh, ceridophile elements in there. So those are all those things that you're going to want to see that want to form and be incorporated into a, a metal type meteorite versus a lithophile, which would be a stony type meteorite. And originally we classified them into three groups. Uh, and those groups were based on uh, what type of structure they had. Uh, so I got them listed down here. You had the hexahedrites, the octahedrites, and the ataxites. So hexahedrites are, are very low in nickel content, so you won't get a with Mattenstein pattern. Uh, you will get some Newman bands in there, uh, which are a function of shock going through the meteorite, and it leaves these bands in the material uh, perpendicular to the, the shock front. The octahedrites are what, uh, what we see a lot of times with the with Mattenstein pattern, um, and that's broken down. And I added all the different breakdowns here because uh, it's still relevant, right? So we don't classify this at the top level anymore by the structure. Uh, but we still do talk in the classifications about whether it's a coarsest octahedrite or a fine or a finest octahedrite. So those are all the breakdowns there. And basically they're telling you the width of the bands in the pattern. Um, so they're all listed there if you want to scroll back through it later on and see what they are. And they did have I was a say, You might want to grab a screen grab of this. This is cool information. Yeah. Um, so they, they did have a shorthand for it. So you might see like uh, for coarsest OGG. So old labels will have OGG iron on it. And what that's telling you is <laughs> that was a coarsest octahedrite. If you've if you never run across what that meant before, um, and then the attack sites were the third one, and again, those are very high nickel content. Uh, they're on the opposite side of the spectrum for the hexahedrites, so you're talking really high content, and that drives it to also not have a wood woods matinee pattern either. So again, you have two types of of irons that really don't have patterns to them. And again, like I said, it's all still important. These are all bits and pieces that you'll hear about it. Uh, what we changed over to is that tells you the structure, but it doesn't tell you where they're from. And the majority of all of our classifications now, the whole point is to try to say, these are all from a, a, a like parent body. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, what they started doing was they started looking at the trace elements inside of the iron meteorites. Um, so your, your big ones are your, your, your gallium, your germanium, and your iridium. But they also look at other things like arsenic, uh, silver, gold, things like that. Uh, based on the composition of these trace elements in there, they can start to plot them against the amount of nickel in there. Uh, and I'll show you on a future slide. That kind of takes all these different meteorites and puts them into different groupings. Uh, basically, so as certain series precipitate out into the, the metal, um, basically you have incompatibilities between the, the groupings. So you could say, okay, well, all these in this one region as you plot them out against their nickel content, can't be related to these other ones because the amount of, of metal in there would, would be in a different series. And that started out, uh, you know, they were talking, uh, was this uh, 1950s, 1960s-ish? It uh, started out with just four groups. And then as they started looking at it, some of those groups, they were able to find more pieces and say, okay, well, looking at different trace elements, these two can't be related to each other. So they split some of those groups. So like you have the, uh, the four or A's and the four B's. Well, that's because, you know, they found that there was differentiation in there and they couldn't be the same. Then you had some other groups where they looked at it and they started to go, okay, well, it's separated. And then later on, they found some pieces that had intermediate compositions um, and they started to tie it back together. So there you get like the, the two A, B group. Uh, so they, they split off. There was a two A, there was a two B and they found those intermediates and they merged them back together. So that's why you'll have some groups with a single letter, some groups with a double letter on there. And those are based on the mergers. Very interesting, man. Yep. Uh, so again, I was, I was saying, you know, they all plot out to, uh, to different spaces. So here's uh, a version of the chart. Uh, and you can see down on the bottom, you have a uh, whole nickel content in the meteorite. And then because it's, you're talking trace elements, so you're talking really tiny amounts. So I know we've always had the thing, you know, oh, there's gold in meteorites. Well, yeah, sure, there's gold in meteorites. That's one of the things <laughs> they actually use to differentiate them. 
but you're talking like parts per billion, parts mm -hmm. per million, yeah, yeah, very low parts per million. So you can see on the vertical scale, uh, the the germanium is is in a like a log scale, right? Because that's how little you're talking. If you plotted it against nickel one for one, it would be flat line. You wouldn't see it. So they expanded it out. They put it on a log scale on the one side and a, and a whole composition on the other side. And you start to see where everything groups out. And you can see it's, it's kind of small here. You see where they, the, you know, the four B's are, the four A's, how they kind of split and they're not together. Um, so yeah, it's, it really shows you how uh, based on the little bits of trace elements in there, they're, they're not all the same. And that's each one represents a different parent body. Yep. That is a screen grab slide too, by the way, guys. <laughs> yep. So, the, the next slide I got, this is the technical breakdown, and I'm not going to go into everything. Again, this is another kind of screen grab shot. But if you wanted to know what defines each of the classes we're talking about today, uh, this has the breakdowns in there by, by uh, milligrams per gram uh, that uh, kind of define the low end and high end of the range. And again, you see there, they're looking at things like arsenic. They're looking at things like gold and phosphorus, uh, which don't show up in, in very big amounts. But then also, to a degree, like we said, that structure still comes into play. So like, if you look at the, the two AB group, you know, the two A's are hexahedrites and the two B's are uh, coarsest octahedrites. So they kind of span that range where you have two little nickel in there for the two A's, you know, to really have a woods matenstein pattern to the two B's, uh, where they are just above that minimum range, you get those octahedrites forming out. Um, so again, you know, you don't want to just throw out that, those structural terms. Yeah, I was going to say, the only other thing I wanted to highlight on here was we talked about the, the two E's and you showed that great picture of miles, which was a two E. So mm -hmm. the mile, uh, miles and the two E's are one of two types of meteorites that are called partial melts. Um, and I put down in there that they're uh, primitive achondrites in parentheses, that's what PAC means. So they used to call those non-magmatic irons, um, and that's terms kind of fallen out of favor, um, because ultimately, you know, an iron meteorite is going to form from something that was melted. You know, and magmatic basically means you came from a melt. So it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, so they now call them partial melts to kind of dictate the fact that all those other irons we're talking about, those are core irons, right? Those would be heavy differentiation on a planetesimal. And that's all the stuff that sinks all the way down to the core and forms. And these partial melts, they're, they're theorized, a couple of different theories out there, but, you know, some of them are, you know, theorized to be uh, impact melts. So a big impact hits a planetesimal. Um, and if it's an iron impactor, um, you know, it, it melts and kind of forms a pool of metal in, in the crater. And in different parts of this crater, you have different degrees of, of melting of material around it uh, that becomes the silicates uh, inside of these silicated partial melt meteorites. So, the, you know, we're talking the two E's this week and then the, uh, the IABs, the 1ABs, we'll, we'll talk about the second week. But that's why you see those those silicates in there because they're they're not a core differentiation. They're a partial melt, um, be it by impact or um, aluminum twenty six decay. Some people think you know there's a whole, whole bunch of different theories out there. Um, so just the groups by the numbers. Uh, again, you're talking sixty seven thousand meteorites out there, uh, and these are the totals for these groups. So you're you're talking about not a lot. You know, it used to be a lot of irons were found old. Uh, there are a lot of the old finds are irons because they stood out the most. So they were yeah. the thing that people found. And, and even the layman back in the day, uh, you know, recognized that it was, it didn't belong. Um, but now we got, uh, got all the chondrites catching up uh, in the DCA areas. So, uh, so that's fallen off now. Um, but yeah, you see there's only 11 uh, regular C, uh, one Cs and two anomalous. There's, there's a lot of two ABs uh, that, mm -hmm. in this grouping here. Uh, the two C's are pretty much like the rarest of, of the irons. Uh, and then you got two D's at, uh, at 29 total and, and two E's at, uh, you know, the, the mid twenties. So there's not a whole lot of them out there if, if you're an iron person. So they are very special, uh, yeah. as far as being, you know, centerpieces of collections. Do you, as a type collector, do you have a two C? I do. I do. And you'll get to see that in a little bit. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> and that, uh, that is the, the holy grail of my iron set. Nice. Um, so yeah, we, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, again, you know, uh, just, just to recap, those, those two E's are pretty special because they're one of these rare types of irons that aren't a core iron. They're a, a partial melt and they're from a smaller or more primitive body. So yeah, they're, they're, and the uh, only other interesting thing I want to tap on here is there is a diverse uh, degree of silicates in there. So there's actually chondritic silicates in some of these two E irons. 
and they still have chondrules in, in that chondritic material that you can, you can pick out. Wow. Um, all the way down to the point of uh, they also have deep buried uh, type silicate, um, you know, ultramafic minerals in them too. So uh, we basically have samplings from, you know, if this is some sort of giant crater, uh, you know, we have samplings from all around this crater where all this melted metal, you know, consolidated and mixed with the silicates that has everything from, from you know, the chondrite overburden all the way down to, uh, you know, you know, heavily altered, uh, differentiated, well, in a, in a primitive sense, uh, material where that, you know, it was that plant testimony was really starting to push towards, uh, uh, towards having deeper material at the core. Hmm. Wow. It's fascinating because irons are just very complex. They go from, you know, at tax sites with nothing in them to something like miles where we showed you it has the, the big pockets of silicates and large, uh, grains, really cool. Mike, thank you so much once again for teaching us and taking us through uh, Meteorite 101. Every week we look forward to it, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right. Now we have a little bit of live show and tell, starting with Bruiser. Bruce, how are you, man? Doing well. Sorry, I missed the uh, Tucson. Um, so I have Agudal to show off. So this is kind of what most of us are familiar with, probably. These little pieces, this is, uh, this is the stuff that actually I got from Topher to give out. Um, but the reason I'm wearing the gloves, because I have something that most of us don't normally see. Whoa. Whoa. So this is a little over 500 grams of Agadol. Wow. But Agadol? <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. I, didn't know, I didn't know it could look like that. Yeah, it did I. Uh, <laughs> they always look like little, little rocks to me. That's awesome. Must what are the it. little spherical things in there with the halos around them? They're like silicated inclusions, I think. Wow. That's something I didn't expect to see in that either, you know? That is phenomenal. Yeah. You don't see them that size norm normally, and you don't see them sliced. But if you look at the perimeter of the stone, at least from this, this um, CAT scan slice, it doesn't look like it's a whole sculptural one. It looks like a blob. So it might have been a loaf of bread to cut. Yeah. Interesting wow. pattern in there. Yeah. yeah. Is that a melt? Is that all melt remelted? I, have I, have no, I don't no. know. We, we, we all have some Met Bull research to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, buddy. That is a beautiful, beautiful, massive slice. And we missed you in Tucson, man. It would have been great to have you too. Now it is Jim James Shelton. Sir, how are you? I'm good, but that's a tough act to follow there. <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't an end cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a, a campo. And this is about 400 grams. And it's been sliced and etched. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Nice finish. Oh. I love that etching. Beautiful. That's nice. I've got another campo here that's been etched on all sides. Oh, that's even the crust has been etched. <laughs> wow. Wow. The, oh my goodness. Even the edges. That's gorgeous, man. Yeah. Campo is gorgeous. I'm sorry, it is outside and in sometimes. So did you, did you etch that or did you buy it that way? I bought it that way. Uh, somebody was talking about Henbury. This is Henbury. And it's etched. Let me take it out of here. Me. <laughs> There's Mike oh, Farmer's. Wow. Mike Farmer's got a nice one I've been looking at. <laughs> and I have an unetched. This is Odessa, Texas. And... I bought this from the director of the museum in Odessa, uh, Tom Rodman. He's probably passed by now because he was on the original drilling when they drilled the crater. And then he became the director of the museum later on. Wow, great provenance. Wow. Yeah. And then I have a couple of Missouri. You know, I collect Missouri. Mm -hmm. This is licking. Oh, that's gorgeous. Look at that fine pattern. Nice. Pretty. This is my favorite iron. 
Mm. Oh yeah. The this infamous is, Sakota Lynn. Yeah, I've showed this before. This is worth showing again. <laughs> hmm. Here's the backside. And it's got a Jeff Notkin uh, number on it. Cool. That's cool. Wow. Yeah, and it is. Jeff thought enough about that to make it a, a postcard out yeah. of it. He, yeah. Nice. That's, <laughs> that's the same same specimen. That is really a super cool thing. Wow, that is that is fantastic. You were like, how can I how can I beat the Ago doll? Well, I don't I don't want to judge you guys and rank you, but man, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> um, talking about Sakota Lens, Chris Monk in the house. Oh. Hey guys, so did we all recognize the Sakota lens that are the sculpted and um oriented or however we have them in our collections but this is one that's a little bit unique because you don't see oh, sliced yeah. sakotail yeah. in very often no yeah. so this is 129.4 grams it's a wow. fairly thick wow. slice it but it's oh, sliced yeah. and etched cool it has a wide pattern oh that's too. a nice thick Jeez. slab beautiful yeah, I might actually clean this one up a little bit. It, I think that over the years in this crappy, um, it's like one of those cellophane suspension cases that it's in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of damaged that. And I just, in the past five or six months, took it out of there. And I think I'm going to probably try to clean it up and re-etch it. But you just don't, you don't see Sakotel and sliced very much. No. Yeah. I, I agree. And that one actually has a nice little inclusion in there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I may, I may send you my slice and have you do it at the same time, man. All right. All right. Thanks, bud. I appreciate it. That was amazing. Um, we have Mike Kelly available for show and tell, and he's going to show us the Holy grail of his iron meteorite collection. Hey guys, how's it going? So I got uh, three pieces to show off real quick. Uh, first one is this little guy right here. So this is Lake Murray. So this is a 2AB. Uh, this one has a nice little Troy light inclusion in there. This is a little, uh, little uh, like uh, five gram piece here. Lake Murray is really cool because it is probably the oldest unterrestrialized uh, iron meteorite on the planet. So Lake Murray was found in Oklahoma. It was originally found in 1930 on a farm. It was big, uh, ugly oxidized mass in a gully. Uh, it wasn't recognized that it was a meteorite until 1952 when that farm became part of Lake Murray Park and the director of the park recognized it as a meteorite uh, and underneath about five inches of iron shale uh, out of a 270 kilo mass was uh, protected iron uh, and the neat thing about this was the sandstone bed it was found in uh, it's a known sandstone bed it's called the antelope sandstone and that's 110 million years old uh, wow. so this thing was getting stomped on by the dinosaurs back in the day. Wow. And wow. Still well. wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, when, when you get that crust uh, of uh, iron shale forming around it, it actually kind of acts as a protective barrier and it keeps what's underneath from getting further oxidized. So it acts as a, as a protecting skin. Next one I had was this. Uh, this is a 2D. This is nothing. Um, so this was found <laughs> nice, by gold. from Arizona. <laughs> yep. This was found by a gold prospector back in 2010. Uh, and you had mentioned KD meteorites with that slice of miles before. Uh, so KD bought it at a uh, natural history auction and had it uh, classified in its main mass holder. Um, but yeah, yeah, 2010 gold prospecting find. And then mm -hmm. my final piece I wanted to show off tonight was my Kumarina. That's that 2C iron yeah. class. That's uh, one of eight. Uh, wow. So if you type collect the irons, the, the two Cs are the hardest one to close out. Uh, and Kumarina is a, actually a pretty old meteorite. It was found in 1909 in Australia. Also gold prospecting. So this is a cool little slice, and it's got uh, got a little bit of the natural edge on it. So Very nice. Wow. The, so those were the three of, that I had for tonight. A slice of the grail. Well, yep. I have one that I want to show off. This was originally classified as an iron. This was classified as a 2E iron back in 2000. It was first classified as 
an iron in 1968, just a generic iron. But later it was to a 2E and then in 2006, it was upgraded, I think, to a palisite. Does anyone know what meteorite this is? Semchen. Semchen. <laughs> there we go. We got a we got a good group. And look at that. I absolutely love this pattern. So this is obviously one of the one of the pieces that has a majority of its metal, like ninety five percent of it, ninety nine percent of its metal, but. Uh, just if this was originally discovered, no wonder why they thought it was just an iron. Um, this one I just picked up in Tucson and I'm going to have this one reconditioned and it's going to be absolutely stunning when, when we're done. But I thought that was a really nice piece and it fit today's classification. So I get to show it off. <laughs> yep. So thanks everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.